According to this technology I hold in my hands, it was July 6th of 2013, a little over a year ago, that I came home late afternoon and Grace was on the front porch waiting for me, smiling and kind of jumping up and down and I got out of the car and I, I was looking down and I was a little bit preoccupied, if not a little stressed, I don't remember why. Daddy, Daddy, turn around and look toward Winchester and look up. There had been a bad storm, not unlike this one today, and there across the sky was a double what they call in Italy the flashing arch. In Sanskrit, it's known as the bow of Indra. In Amman, they call it the little window in the sky. The North African people call it the bride of the rain. And in Central Europe, it goes by various names, the Arch of St. Martin, the Bridge of the Holy Spirit, or the Crown of St. Bernard. We less romantic and less poetic, pragmatic Americans just call it a rainbow. And there were two of them, and I, I have a picture of it here on my phone. It just looked like it was over Winchester, a double. You've seen a double rainbow, haven't you? Quite beautiful indeed. Since it is a phenomenon of nature, science can describe it this way. Raindrops act as tiny prisms and mirrors to break up sunlight into colors of the spectrum and send colored light back to our eyes. Each raindrop forms many colors, but the color that reaches our eyes from a particular raindrop depends on the angle between our eyes and the sun's rays. The moon can also create one of these. Anybody know where it is? Lake Cumberland, have you ever seen it? It's worth the trip. It used to be one of two in the world, the other one being Angel Falls in Africa, but I read someplace that because of some erosion that Angel Falls no longer produces a rainbow, and if that be so, we have the only one in the world. Whatever the scientific explanation of a rainbow is, for the ancient Hebrews it was a symbol of hope, hopefulness. At the close of a great worldwide catastrophe, a symbol that, that it's not over, a symbol that in spite of how bad things may get and how much one might lose, God is not dead. As you read the text, you realize that it is a reminder not only for God's people, but for God as well. And that in the ancient Hebrew thinking that when rainbows appeared, the sight of God and man both converged on the rainbow because God says, I will be looking at the rainbow and it will remind me as it is reminding you. So as the prisms become the intersection of color, or the drops of rain becomes prison that intersect the color. It also intersects the gaze of God and man. And that hope in Hebrew thinking was grounded not in man, but in God, and not only in God, but in the character and nature of God. I will set my bow in the cloud. Primitive religion had a confused view of, of God as religion developed. One on the positive side was good. There's sunshine, there's rain, there's food, there's water, the seasons come and go. You can plant, there's lush vegeta vegetation, you can reap, you can eat, you can be fruitful and multiply. But then there was also a fearful view. There are earthquakes, there are floods, there are droughts. Southern California has been in one for a decade in which the very reserves of water far beneath the ground are terribly depleted. And it looks like it's 
things don't change, that part of our nation is becoming a desert that will not be able to sustain life, and they're fighting over water rights now. So there's a positive side and there's a dim side, a confusing message from nature sometimes. This is the Hebrew choice to believe in the God who has set his bow in the clouds. What is the bow? It's the bow of the bow and arrow. The psalmist can write that lightning is arrow, is arrow, arrows from God's bow. It certainly looks like it, doesn't it? So here is a progressive revelation about what kind of a God do we have? Do we have a God who makes war on mankind? No, we have a God who has hung up his bow. He's hung up his guns, as they would say in the West, the gunslinger that's hung up his guns. He's not going to fight anymore. I've hung my bow in the clouds. Unilateral disarmament on God's part. And part of the explanation is God's realization in the passage, you know, even though... Even though I sent the flood because of man's sin and tried to start all over again, man's going to continue to sin. It says that even after the flood. The flood's not going to cure sin. Making war on man doesn't cure sin. So here's, here's a suggestion that maybe God is going to be a God of mercy and of hope, who's, make, who's making certain promises in this passage. And one of them is that we're going to get rain. That as long as the earth exists, in general, the seasons are going to come and go, and we can conduct hopeful living because God is good. That, that's the message, you see. We can hope because God is good. God's creation we had already read. God saw that it was good, and it is good because God is good. That's the first gospel, if you will, of the Bible. And Paul would reflect on that and other things when he would write to the Romans who were having war made on them, the Roman Christians, if God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us. Who can be against us? He who by that time spared not his own son even, but gave him up for us all. Will he not also give us all good things grounded in the character of God, but also a hope that was grounded in the in the creation itself that is able to bring forth life and prosperity that we as Americans have certainly enjoyed. And God is, is viewed here as the sustainer of that life, that universe, that good earth that man was told earlier in creation to take care of it, be fruitful and multiply, but also replenish the earth. Be good to the earth and it will be good to you. This is a part of the Noachic covenant as it's, as it's called. The very laws of nature such as gravity are part of what make life possible. Somebody said, well, can man destroy the earth? Here's God's promise never to destroy the earth. Can man destroy the earth? That's a real good question for another sermon. Not this one. Suffice it to say, if the earth is destroyed, this passage asserts that it will not be God's fault. It will be man's fault. Once again here, as we've started all over in, with, with Noah, the flood having destroyed all in the storyline, if we had read the first three verses of chapter 9, which I skipped over in the interest of time, we would read God saying, Here, Noah and your family and descendants, I give it all to you. That's the exact quote of verse 3. I give it all to you. Here's the earth. In a sense, as our world expands through space, to some extent, maybe God's given it all to us. Take care of it. And the rainbow becomes a reminder, not only of God's goodness and the goodness of creation, but of our responsibility to be stewards of that creation, to not waste it or to destroy it. But then the rainbow, we all know, has personal dimensions too. 
it has an application to our lives. It becomes a parable of life. That is to say, like Noah, we build our arks. We gather the necessities of life that will sustain our families and our communities. We buy life insurance so that we can provide for our children after we're gone. We try to set some sort of security. We build hospitals to help keep us healthy. We go to medical schools. We build churches. We build schools. We, not unlike, we try to build our ark of civilization, if you will. But we learn from time to time that we're not in complete control of what might happen. Our families might be flying over in a jetliner over Ukraine and get shot down totally innocent. They might be working in the Twin Towers in New York in 2001 and be struck down innocently. They might be in a typhoon or a tidal wave or a tornado and be innocently struck down for no apparent reason. There are those calamities that can sink our ships and make us lose hope and all the securities that we think we might be able to create. It can be as personal as the loss of a spouse. Dr. Duke McCall was president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary when I was a student there, followed by Dr. Roy Honeycutt. Years later, as Dr. McCall and my parents were good friends, his wife died. They were, they were dear friends of my parents, and someone interviewed Dr. McCall at the Baptist World Alliance not long after his wife had passed away, and told, he told of an experience after his wife died. A friend expressed his sorrow by saying, I'm so sorry you lost your wife. And Dr. McCall responded, I didn't lose my wife. I know where she is. I'm the one that's lost. Loss of hope. Loss of, of happiness. Um, what do you do in life when the flood comes? When all of the security that you might have built is eroded somehow by some event beyond your control? Or what do you do when your boat begins to sink and it is all or partially your fault? Circumstances don't matter a lot. A sinking ship is a sinking ship. Maybe it's just bad news from the doctor. What do you do? Loss of a job, what do you do? Alexander Pope wrote that hope keeps trying no matter what because hope springs eternal in the human breast. There was a little poem that my grandfather and father used to quote. Two frogs fell into a deep cream bowl. One was an optimistic soul, the other took the gloomy view. We'll drown in here, he cried, with no more ado. So at last, with a despairing cry, he flung up his legs and said goodbye. Said the other frog with a plucky grin, I can't get out, but I won't give in. I'll just swim around till my strength is spent. Then I can die the more content. His struggles began to churn the cream. At last, on top of the butter, he stopped. And out of the bowl, he gladly hopped. What is the moral? It's easily found. When you can't get out, keep swimming around. When you can't get out, keep swimming around. Does hope spring eternal? By now, perhaps you've noticed in your bulletin a picture that's a little fuzzy. It is a picture painted in 1886, which was world famous at the time, by George Frederick Watts, who was born in 1817 and died in 1904. He was a London, England artist. The painting by George Watts shows a female allegorical figure of hope. Normally, hope is illustrated with an anchor but Watts took an original approach. In his painting, she is depicted sitting on a globe beneath the universe, blindfolded, clutching a wooden harp with only one string left intact. She sits in a hunched position with her head angled towards the instrument. 
perhaps so she can hear the faint music she can make with the sole remaining string. According to Watts, hope need not mean expectancy. It suggests rather the music that can come from one remaining chord. Hope as a painting inspired the 1922 film by the same name with Herbert Blanche and Mary Astor posing as Hope and served as a national advertisement for IBM in the early days. It has been suggested as the influence of Picasso's early bluebird painting, blue period paintings, especially the musician called the old guitarist. Martin Luther King Jr. referenced hope in his sermon, Shattered Dreams, in his collection of sermons, Strength of Love. Nelson Mandela had a print of the painting hanging on his prison cell for 25 years. After Egypt defeated Israel, was defeated by Israel during the Six Day War, the Egyptian government issued copies to every one of its troops. The painting was the subject of a lecture by Dr. Frederick Sampson in Richmond, Virginia in the 1980s. The lecture was attended by Pastor Jeremiah Wright and inspired him to give a sermon in 1990 on the subject of hope in Chicago. He preached, quote, with her clothes in rags, her body scarred and bruised and bleeding, her harp all but destroyed, and with only one string left, she had the audacity to make music and praise God. To take the one string you have left in your life and have the audacity to hope, that's the real word of God to be heard in this passage and illustrated in Watts' painting. Having heard the sermon, President Barack Obama later adopted the phrase, the audacity of hope, and it was the title of his keynote address in the 2004 Democratic Convention and became the title of his book. How does God make a rainbow? Ironically, it is composed of the exact same elements that created the storm. Think about it. The residue from the storm leaves behind the bride of the rain, as the North Africans call it, and that in every storm of life that we have, as it subsides, as they all eventually do, we are to look for the droplets of hope that springs eternal in the human breast. What about your life? Is it fairly stable? Seed time and harvest, the seasons are coming and going well? Then the message of the passage would be, then be fruitful and productive. Or is your life washed out for the moment? Have you known times when everything, as it were, seems to have gone down the river? Or like the painting, has your harp ever been reduced to only one string? If so, angle your ear toward it and try to make the music of hope. The Hebrews did, Jesus did, and as I was reminded by my daughter a year ago when I came home, Daddy, look up. Rainbows are silent. Hope doesn't announce itself with great cannon volleys or trumpet sounds. It is just there like the stillness of God. But we have to look up to see it. May we pray. Our Father, may we be reminded by this ancient passage and those who have referred to it time and again that you are not making war on us, that life is good in spite of its storms, and that hope comes from you. May we always seize it, come what may. And if our daubers are down, as it were, may we be reminded to lift them up, to be still and know that you are God. 
and to see the beautiful colors of life before us that remain. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 405. It calls us to have faith in God. Dad used to say, God is not dead, son. Something good will come of this. Have faith in God. If you would like to seek Christ as your Lord and Savior publicly, if you would like to cast your lot with First Baptist Church as a full member, if you'd like to dedicate your life in reference to your birthday, rededicate your life to Christ, or whatever, if your decision is public, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. <laughs>